right. Good morning, church. It's great to see you this morning. Let's all stand if you're willing and able. Happy Sunday. I just wanted to read to you briefly from the book of Exodus about who our God is. It says in Exodus 15, verse 2, The Lord is my strength and my song, and he has become my salvation. This is my God, and I will praise him, my Father's God, and I will exalt him. Lord, we are so thankful to serve a God who is with us, but who's also above us. That you're the God who walks with us, but you're also the God who guides us. Thank you that you're a God of peace, but you're a God of action. And so today we want to just lift our eyes up to you, whatever we're going through and experiencing, and say you are the God of my salvation. No matter what happens in this life, you are the God who is in control, and you are the God who saves. So thank you, Lord, that we get to come to this house today as your people, your children, and reach out to our Father. Thank you for meeting us here, and we pray now as we sing to you that your name would be lifted up in your house, that you would get the honor and the glory that you deserve. And we ask humbly, Lord, that you would strengthen your people as we worship you today. So thank you for this opportunity. Would you be blessed and honored? In your name we pray. Amen. Amen. Let's sing. Jesus. Let's sing this together. I was buried beneath my shame. Who could carry that kind of weight? It was my tomb till I met you. Praise God. I was breathing but not alive All my failures I tried to hide It was my tomb Till I met you Oh, let's sing this. You called. You called my name I ran out of that grave, out of the darkness, into your glorious day. You call my name. I ran out of that grave, out of the darkness, into your glorious day. Oh, is that your story this morning that our God has saved you? Praise God. Your mercy has saved my soul. Now your freedom is all that I know. The old may knew Jesus when I met you. Call my name. I ran out of that grave, out of the darkness, into your glorious day. You call my name. I ran out of that grave, out of the darkness. Into your glorious day. Oh, I needed rescue. I needed rescue. My sin was heavy, but chains break at the weight of your glory. I needed shelter. I was an orphan, but you call me a citizen. When I was broken, you were my healing. Now your love is the air that I'm breathing. I have a future, my eyes are open. Cause when you call my name, I ran out of that grave. 
out of the darkness into your glorious day. You call my name. I ran out of that glorious day. I'll praise Jesus for his mercy and grace today. Promises are yes and amen. Oh, if you need rest today, would you just open up your hands like this to the Lord, just in a posture of receiving?
your promises are yes and amen. Faithful you are. Faithful forever you will be. Faithful you are. All your promises are yes and amen. All your promises are yes and amen. All your promises are yes and amen. Faithful you are. Faithful. All your promises are yes and amen. All your promises are yes and amen. All your promises are yes and amen. Oh God, if our hearts are weary today, we want to choose faith, believing that you are that God who saves and redeems and is with us. We're thankful for the, the ways you've shown your faithfulness in the past. And we're choosing to trust that you'll be faithful for the future. Fill our hearts with that gift of faith this morning. We love you, we honor you. Until I lay my head, I will sing of the goodness of God.
Lord, we thank you for your goodness. And Lord, we sing of your holiness today. We join with the angels today and we sing of your glory and your goodness and your majesty, Lord. We thank you. We thank you. A thousand generations falling down in worship to sing the song of ages to us. your name is your name is the highest your name is the greatest your name stands above them all all thrones all thrones and dominions all powers and positions your name stands above them all and the angels cry Holy, all creation cries. Holy, you are lifted high. Holy, holy forever. And if you've been forgiven, and if you've been Good news, amen. You walk in freedom. And if you bear his name, you sing a song forever to Oh, we'll sing the song forever and amen. And the angels cry. Holy, all creation. Your name is your name is the highest, your name is the greatest, your name stands above them all our thrones, oh, all thrones and dominions, all powers and positions, your name stands above them all. Sing that again, your name. Your name is the highest, your name is the greatest, your name stands above them all. Our thrones, our thrones, and dominions, all powers and positions, your name stands above them all, and the angels. 
Let's sing that chorus again, just our voices. And the angels cry, holy, all creation cries, holy, you are lifted high, holy, holy forever. Hear your people sing, holy to the King of kings, holy you will always be, holy, holy forever, amen, you will always, you will always be. And this morning, we get the honor of continuing in our worship through our giving. Behind me on the screen, there are three ways that we can give. So let's pray for this morning's offering. So, Lord, we thank you so much for receiving our gifts, Lord. And we're so looking forward to what you're going to do, Lord, continuing to bless, to reach those, Lord, that you're trying to reach. Lord, we thank you so much for all that you do. Lord, We it is our mission here to make Jesus famous. Lord, Lord we pray that many, many would continue to know you, that you would continue to expand your kingdom, Lord. And we just thank you for being able to partner with you in your work. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Church, you can take a seat. Church, I'm Christina. I help lead the kids and women's ministries here at Calvary. Before I tell you what's happening around here, I'd love to welcome those of you who are new. So if that's you, our church would love to meet you, say hi, and give you a welcome gift. So please visit the Welcome Center after service or just text the number on the chair in front of you. We are so glad that you're here. Here's what's happening at Calvary. Life group signups are open now. Here's a story from some former life group leaders and hosts just to show you how God ministers to the church through these groups. I joined life groups because uh, I wanted the church to feel smaller. I wanted to feel really connected. And life group, like it really did that. Just meeting, you know, 10, 12 people all at once. And it just made church feel so much more like being a part of a family. I like life groups because once you just walk in, you know that you'll be welcomed. I think the great part of it all is that I come in and I know that I'll be prayed for, that I'll be cared for, that I'll be supported, that I'll be encouraged and just like being pointed back to Christ because these are people who um, want to be there with you. So I love that part where there's just a lot of unity. 
No, I definitely think uh, Life Groups has helped me in my relationship with the Lord by really helping me grow to trust Him more um, and just kind of see what the Lord can do in our life if we let Him take the lead uh, and, and take those steps of faith, step out of our comfort zone. Uh, and I've come to find that that's a lot easier when you have a support group around you like you have in a life group. I really think that there's there's Calvary before joining a life group and then there's Calvary after joining a life group. The, the biggest, most like obvious thing to do to get plugged in is to join a life group and and then see what, what Calvary is like after joining a life group. You guys would probably say it's a different church oh, after absolutely. that. absolutely. Yeah. Life group registration is happening now. Join a group by heading to the patio after service or going on our website. Next Sunday is our annual Missions and Outreach Sunday. We are thrilled to welcome our guest speaker, Justin Thomas. He's the president of Calvary Chapel Bible College, and he'll be here to teach on the theme of proximity. What does it look like to get in proximity with the lost and the hurting? Why does it matter? Pastor Justin has a great vision for what God is doing in and through his people to winsomely engage the secular world, to love our neighbors, and to invite them into God's kingdom. After service, you're also going to have the opportunity to engage with 10 outreach ministries on the patio and discern where God might be asking you to get in proximity with people who have real spiritual and physical needs and share his love with them. It's going to be a blast and you won't want to miss it. Worship and prayer are at the heart of everything we do as believers. As we go through life, though, it can be easy to become distracted and overwhelmed. But this is why we gather together regularly. We want to capitalize on every moment we can get to lean into worship and prayer together. At our upcoming night of worship, we'll spend time together reading scripture, praying, and worshiping Jesus through song. Dinner and child care will be available. Our next baptism opportunity is coming up on the last Sunday of this month. If you have decided to follow Christ and are ready to publicly proclaim your new life to your church family, fill out the form online and we'll be in touch with you. We can't wait to rejoice with you. To learn more about how you can get involved in church life, sign up for our weekly newsletter called The Calvary Connection. And now let's double check that our cell phones are on silent mode Get out your Bibles and prepare for the teaching of God's Word. God bless you, church. All right. Good morning, church. Great to see you guys. Let's take out our Bibles today and turn to the book of Exodus. Uh, we took a break last week from Exodus because we had a power outage, so we called an audible and went to Psalm 57, but we're going to pick back up our study of Exodus today in Exodus chapter 32, if you turn there uh, in your Bibles. We've got... One more teaching in Exodus, which we'll do after our mission Sunday next week. I can't wait for you to hear uh, Pastor Justin share next week. He is the president of Calvary Chapel Bible College currently, but before that, he had a long run uh, planting and pastoring a church on Capitol Hill in Seattle. And uh, if you followed the news over the last five or six years, you know that Capitol Hill was a wild place to do ministry. And so he's got great stories of what it's like to be in proximity with those who need to hear about Jesus and just being faithful uh, in a place like that. So I can't wait to have you hear from him. Then we'll finish Exodus the Sunday after Mission Sunday. And then after that, we're going to get into the book of Micah together. A uh, little seven-chapter prophecy in the Old Testament it might be the first time for some of you that you've gone from the first verse to the last verse of one of the Old Testament prophets. So it's going to be an honor to be able to go through uh, that book together. Before we get into the text today, I just want to double back and say, yeah, I'm looking forward to the life group quarter this quarter. And especially for those of you who are newer to church in general or are newer to this church in particular I want to encourage you to take that bold step of faith. I know it can be a scary thing to shift from watching online, looking at the church from afar, then darkening the doors and coming live and in person. And then, Nate, you're crazy. I'm going to go to someone's house. That's like a move that many people don't want to make. But it really is true that the walls begin coming down and connections that need to happen really begin to occur 
And so I'd, I'd encourage you in that direction. We, we just live in a time where we have to discipline ourselves to pursue actual, tangible human connections and relationship because it's so easy to drift into just the digital sphere and distracting ourselves and all of that. So I'd encourage you today to get into a group if that describes you. Okay, today we're looking at Exodus 32 to 34. It would take us about 20 minutes to just read through that entire passage. So I have selected two portions, the first 10 verses, or 11 verses, excuse me, of chapter 32 and the first 10 of chapter 34. We'll put them on the screen, but if you want to follow along there or in your Bibles, feel free. Let's read it together. So it's in verse 1. When the people saw that Moses delayed to come down from the mountain... The people gathered themselves together to Aaron and said to him, Up, make us gods who shall go before us. As for this Moses, the man who brought us up out of the land of Egypt, we do not know what has become of him. So Aaron said to them, Take off the rings of gold that are in the ears of your wives, your sons, and your daughters, and bring them to me. So all the people took off the rings of gold that were in their ears and brought them to Aaron. And he received the gold from their hand and fashioned it with a graving tool and made a golden calf. And they said, These are your gods, O Israel, who brought you up out of the land of Egypt. When Aaron saw this, he built an altar before it. And Aaron made a proclamation and said, Tomorrow shall be a feast to the Lord. And they rose up early the next day and offered burnt offerings and brought peace offerings. And the people sat down to eat and drink and rose up to play. In verse 7, the Lord said to Moses, Go down, for your people whom you brought up out of the land of Egypt have corrupted themselves. They have turned aside quickly out of the way that I commanded them. They have made for themselves a golden calf and have worshipped it and sacrificed to it and said, These are your gods, O Israel, who brought you up out of the land of Egypt. And the Lord said to Moses, I have seen this people. And behold, it is a stiff-necked people. Now therefore let me alone that my wrath may burn hot against them and I may consume them in order that I may make a great nation of you. But Moses implored the Lord his God. And said, O Lord, why does your wrath burn hot against your people whom you have brought out of the land of Egypt with great power and with a mighty hand? Other conversation went on, but let's jump forward to chapter 34, verse 1. After a moment of prayer and interaction, the Lord said to Moses, Cut for yourself two tablets of stone like the first. I will write on the tablets the words that were on the first tablets which you broke. Be ready in the morning. And come up in the morning to Mount Sinai to present yourself there to me on top of the mountain. No one shall come up with you and let no one be seen throughout all the mountain. Let no flocks or herds graze opposite that mountain. So Moses cut two tablets of stone like the first. And he rose early in the morning and went up on Mount Sinai as the Lord had commanded him. And he took in his hand two tablets of stone. The Lord descended in the cloud. And stood with him there and proclaimed the name of the Lord. The Lord passed by before him and proclaimed the Lord, the Lord, a God merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness, keeping steadfast love for thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin, but who will by no means clear the guilty visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children and the children's children to the third and fourth generation. And Moses quickly bowed his head toward the earth and worshiped. And he said, If now I have found favor in your sight, O Lord, please let the Lord go in the midst of us, for it is a stiff-necked people, and pardon our iniquity and our sin, and take us for your inheritance. And he said, Behold, I am making a covenant. Before all your people I will do marvels such as have not been created in all the earth or in any nation, and all the people among whom you are shall see the work of the Lord. For it is an awesome thing that I will do with you. Let's pray together. Lord, we pray this morning just thinking about this passage, this movement, this dark movement in Israel's life and history and trajectory, but also this glorious moment in your revelation to us. 
We pray, Lord, that you'd speak to us from it, that you'd teach us, Lord, who you are from your word. Tell us, Lord, of what your nature is like, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, things at this point in the book of Exodus could not have been going much better for the people of Israel. Uh, After 400 years in Egypt, God's people were now free. Through the plagues, through the blood of the Passover lamb, through the waters of the Red Sea, Yahweh had rescued his people. And just as he had promised Moses at the burning bush, They had come to God's mountain to hear God's voice. And that's what we've been thinking about over the past few chapters in Exodus. There at that mountain, God invited these descendants of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob to enter into a marriage-like covenant with himself so that they could be a kingdom of priests and a holy nation who represented Yahweh to the world Around them, and they responded to God's invitation with a resounding yes, we want in, we want to be God's treasured possession, His special people. So, three days later, they gathered together at Mount Sinai, and God spoke the Ten Commandments to the entire congregation and followed it up to Moses with hundreds of more specific laws in the book. Of the covenant, and he promised, I will go before you into the land where you will build your home and your holy nation. When the Hebrews heard these words from Yahweh, they accepted all of them and they ratified this covenant, this marriage with God, with a blood sacrifice. Then Moses, as we saw a few weeks ago, went up to the top of the mountain to be alone in God's presence for 40 years days. During that time, God gave Moses the plans for the tabernacle system that he would use as a way to dwell among his people. And he also wrote the Ten Commandments that he'd already said to Israel on tablets of stone. God told Moses to receive an offering when he went back down the mountain with all the materials that were needed for God's house. He told Moses about all the furniture that would be inside and outside of his house, an altar of sacrifice, a basin for washing were on the outside, while a lampstand and a table and an altar of incense were on the inside. And in the innermost room of his house, God told Moses, there would be an Ark of the Covenant, a box where God promised that he would meet with Israel. Yahweh gave then Moses plans for Israel's priesthood. Aaron and his descendants would serve the people by offering sacrifices and prayers and interacting with God on their behalf. Israel would be God's special people gathered at his tent to commune with him, a holy nation and a kingdom of priests centered upon Yahweh. It was beautiful. Like I said, it couldn't have been going any better. But as those 40 days on the mountain drew to a close, Yahweh told Moses what was happening in the valley below. Aaron and the people were undoing nearly every element of the covenant God had created. Well, Moses received the plans for the tabernacle and the two tablets, Israel wondered down below if he would ever return. Well, Moses' absence neared the six-week mark. The people demanded something tangible to worship and told Aaron to make them gods who would go before them. Aaron made them this golden calf, which he said brought them out of Egypt, and they worshiped it. The next day, Aaron added to the confusion by proclaiming a feast to Yahweh, which became only another day to sacrifice to the golden calf and engage in community-wide orgiastic celebrations before their new false god. Needless to say, God was angry. And it's this anger that we are going to consider this morning. Uh, But I'm going to drive this episode all the way through to chapter 34, beyond the cliffhanger of God's wrath revealed in chapter 32, 
lest I fail to give the entire picture of who God is. Too often, Exodus 32, the worship of the golden calf, is used as a great opportunity to beat people up. Oh, you're a bunch of idol worshipers, and you know it, and God is angry about it, and we close the book and pause until God reveals himself most fully in chapter 34. At the end of this story, after hearing Moses' mediative voice, God reveals his truest nature and how much he loves these golden calf worshipers in the valley below. We're not to think of God as an abusive husband flying off the handle in a rage, but a broken-hearted husband, sad at what his spouse is doing in the valley below. We're not to think of God as a raging father lashing out in anger when his children disappoint him, but one who cares deeply for his children and is pained at the self-destructive choices they are making. Though Israel broke their covenant with God down in that valley, God restored that covenant at the end of this story and brought them right back into his plans. So though there's a ton we could draw from these three chapters, what we're going to do today is restrain ourselves to three questions. First, what angers God? Second, what is God truly like? And third, how can we experience that God if we want to. Okay, so let's think about this first question. What angers God? What angers God? I'm pretty sure that for some of you right now, even the question itself makes you feel a little weird, like you're uncomfortable with the idea that God could feel anger at all. You know, many of us don't want to think of God as capable of anger, uh, capable of feeling even, and definitely not capable of wrath. Uh, But in our passage, God clearly said to Moses, I've seen this people, it's a stiff-necked people, let me alone, therefore, that my wrath may burn hot against them and I may consume them in order that I may make a great nation of you. Now, I know what some people like to do with words like this in the Bible and especially in the Old Testament. A lot of people like to jump in a little uh, escape pod called the That's the God of the Old Testament escape pod, (laughs) okay? But there's a couple reasons you can't do that. First of all, the Old Testament is our Bible too, yo. (laughs) You know, it took a long time for the New Testament to get developed. How do you think the early church got launched? They opened up the Bible. They turned to the Old Testament. This is our Bible too. Uh, Secondly, the New Testament talks about God's wrath as well. Paul said it like this in Romans 1.18. He said, the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who by their unrighteousness suppress the truth. I mean, if you want to understand what's going on in our world, society, culture today, go read from that verse on in Romans chapter 1. You'll see a, dis- a description of what is happening in our world today. Now, there are no exegetical ninja skills that I can apply here to soften these sentences about God. I, I can't tell you today that words like wrath and burn hot and consume them, actually in the Hebrew are words for deep care, warm feelings, and snuggle time. I I can't tell you that. And I hesitate to obfuscate with a $5 word like anthropomorphism. You know, this is just human language describing the feelings or the actions of the divine. No, the simple and straightforward answer is best. God was angry. God did not act out on that anger here in this episode, but he did tell his friend Moses all about it. Some even say that God was processing his feelings and bringing his man Moses into his pathos. Moses then appealed to God on multiple levels. God responded by declaring his nature before restoring his people. He loved the golden calf worshipers in the valley below. But we often get too tripped up by the fact that God can be angry to ask just what is it that angers him? Somehow along the way, we came to think that God should be stoic, that God should be unemotional, that God should be detached. But he isn't. What good father doesn't care about his children? 
and doesn't care about their actions. For some reason, God has decided that it's worth his time to invest himself in rescuing his people and fighting for a restoration of all that was lost in the Garden of Eden. And it angers him when something undoes his restorative work in his people's lives. And that is precisely what is happening in this passage. You gotta understand, God is not snapping here because someone said a swear or someone thought a lustful thought. God is not lashing out because someone watched a movie they shouldn't have watched or broke the speed limit. God isn't acting out as a cosmic killjoy here who hates seeing his people have a good time in the valley below. No, God is angry because while he had been recreating the Garden of Eden, they were destroying it. Right when God was in the middle of telling them how he would dwell tangibly in their midst in that tabernacle, as he had in Eden, they were breaking the covenant. Well, God told Moses to collect the various elements, including gold for the tabernacle and its elements. They were using that very same gold to make a calf for their licentious forms of worship. Well, God was explaining a tabernacle system that would create a point of contact between him and his people, they were creating a competing point of contact with a false idol. Well, God was detailing to Moses an altar and the annual festivals that his people would participate in, they were building their own altar and engaging in their own festival. And while God was describing a holy priesthood that would flow from Aaron and his ancestry that would help keep the nation's eyes on God. Aaron below was acting as a priest who drew God's people away from God. They were undoing all the commandments down in the valley. Other gods making idols, disrespecting leaders, engaging in sexual sin. They were a runaway train against the entire covenant they had just made with God. This was the cataclysmic rejection of the beautiful covenant that God had just spent hundreds of years making. This is not just adultery. This is like a new bride committing adultery on her honeymoon. That's what breaks God's heart. What angers him is when his people go into self-destroy mode to rage against the beautiful destiny he has spent so much to build for them. He was angry with them because of his intense love for them. By the end of this passage, he will recommit to these very same people and restore them back to the covenant, but it it grieved his fatherly heart to see them settling for something so cheap and so dehumanizing when they could have waited for his true presence and his true glory to dwell among them. It broke his heart to see them debasing themselves for so much less than what he was going to give them for free. God's heart was broken. I was recently talking to my youngest daughter, and uh, she's a sophomore in high school, and she got an opportunity this year to go to her first like high school sporting event that had cheerleaders at it. And so she came home and she's kind of, she's, she tells us what's going on. And so she, she mentioned the cheerleaders and I asked her, I'm like, Oh, what'd you think about the, the cheerleaders? You know, like what, what was that like for you? And she's like, they were really cool, but they sure spell out a lot of things. You know, <laughs> that was her comment, you know, V I C T R O Y, you know, kind of deal. Well, this passage, this is God spelling out the stuff of his heart. All the way back in chapter 20, he said, In the Ten Commandments, I, the Lord, your God, am a jealous God. And at the end of this passage in chapter 34, verse 14, God will declare himself again to be a jealous God. What that means It's not that he's paranoid or strange, but he wants exclusivity with us. 
He craves us for himself because he knows he's the only God who will not hurt us. What angers him are things that degrade us and things that distance us from him. Things that take us out of relational closeness with him and marital faithfulness to him. That's what angers God. Okay, the second question that I want to ask today, and we've already been thinking about it to a degree, but is the, is the question, what is God like? According to this passage, what is God like? Uh, this question is the reason I wanted to drive all the way to chapter 34 uh, in one sitting. Because if we only focused on God's response in chapter 32 to the golden calf, we might miss the truest depiction of himself to Moses in chapter 34. Uh, but to find out what God is like so that we might know him best, we, we need this last segment of the episode. What happened here is that from the tent uh, of meeting that Moses built, uh, he uttered three prayers to Yahweh. Uh, the first prayer uh, was a request that God would reveal himself more fully. Uh, he felt unsure of God's plans after the golden calf incident. And God told him that his angel would go with him into the promised land, but Moses wanted more details. You know, how's that going to look? So he said to God in 33:13, show me now your ways that I may know you in order to find favor in your sight. And God responded, my presence will go with you, and I will give you rest. So God says, I'm going to go with you. But Moses wanted confirmation of that, so he said a second prayer. He said, if your presence in 35, or 33, 15, he said, if your presence will not go with me, do not bring us up from here. Like, I don't, I don't want to go into the promised land if you're not going to go with us. I love you. I love the commandments, the law, the covenant, Sinai, but I look forward to the worship of the tabernacle uh, but will that even happen now that these people have worshipped the golden calf? And God said in 33, 17, this very thing that you have spoken, I will do, for you have found favor in my sight. So I'm going to go with you. Uh, with that, though, Moses blurted out his third and final prayer in 33, 18. He said, please show me your glory. Like he just couldn't stand it anymore. He wanted to see God. And Yahweh responded, I will make all my goodness pass before you, and proclaim before you my name, the Lord. Uh, but you cannot see my face, for man shall not see me and live. Behold, there is a place by me where you shall stand on the rock. And while my glory passes by, I will put you in the cleft of the rock, and I'll cover you with my hand until I have passed by. Then I will take away my hand, and you shall see my back, but my face shall not be seen. So in, in some way, God was going to show Moses the afterglow of his glory and declare his name to his men. So in the morning... Uh, Moses cuts two replacement tablets of stone. We haven't thought about it yet, but when he came down the mountain and saw the people doing what they were doing, he threw the stones down, the Ten Commandments down. They broke. These are replacements for that. And he goes up to Mount Sinai for the seventh time to be with God. Yahweh descends on the mountain in the cloud, and he proclaims his name to Moses. And what God says of himself in Exodus 34, verse 6 and 7, it is the most quoted passage in the Bible by the Bible. You know, it, it's the most cross-referenced scripture in all of God's word, which should tell you something. When God's apostles and prophets were under the inspiration of the Spirit and referring to scripture to tell us what God is like, they most often went to the well of Exodus 34, verse 6 and 7. So what is God like? Well, the first thing we learn is that God is merciful. That, that word is a, is a word that indicates compassion. It's a word that's related to the word womb. It's like God felt like a mother relating to her rebellious teenager as they did what they were doing in the valley below. Who is God merciful towards? Who does God feel compassion toward? Who does God care for? Good people? No, the context is God is merciful to golden calf worshipers. God is also secondarily gracious. He bestows, in other words, favor and blessing. Again, who 
is God gracious to? In the context, God is gracious to golden calf worshipers. He also says, I am slow to anger. In other words, you can make God mad, but it takes a really long time. Other gods are capricious, but Yahweh is long-suffering. Who is he long-suffering to? You guys know the answer to this question. Golden calf worshipers. And God is abounding in steadfast love. This means he's loyal in a super abundant way to who? Golden calf worshipers. God is abounding in faithfulness. This speaks of his authenticity, his integrity, his dependability. Who is he faithful to? Golden calf worshipers. God keeps, he says, his steadfast love for thousands, forgiving iniquity and sin. It's his loyalty that extends to thousands of generations. Yahweh is going to clear and forgive these golden calf worshipers. God, however, as he concludes what his name is, he says, will by no means clear the guilty. In other words, God's disposition is to forgive those guilty of sin. That's why he's merciful and gracious and slow to anger and abounding in loving kindness. But the fact remains that not everyone receives that forgiveness. So they remain in their guilt for their sin. And sin must be addressed because God is just. It's impossible for offenses to bang around the cosmos without eventual payment. Without this final statement, everything that came before it, the mercy and grace and patience and love and forgiveness might just be considered mere cosmic leniency. God's love, however, is not toothless permissiveness but radical grace towards golden calf worshipers who want it. He is forgiving. He is loving. But his grace is not a sloppy dish of cheap or spineless love. He says he visits sin to the third and fourth generations, but that he is prone to dispense grace to thousands of generations, far covering the generations visited because of their sin. What that means is that for every generation of golden calf worshipers, there is a way out. Now, his self-revelation to Moses complete, God heard one final prayer from Moses for Israel, pivoted and said in verse 10 of 34, I am making a covenant. Before all your people, I will do marvels such as have not been created in all the earth or in any nation And all the people among whom you are shall see the work of the Lord, for it is an awesome thing that I will do with you. After that statement, God reiterated the covenant he'd already made with Israel. He listened to Moses' prayers. He declared his true nature, and now he was ready to get back to what he was doing before the golden calf incident. God moved on. It was covenant time. He was ready to move forward with these golden calf worshipers just as he is ready to move forward with us in our forms of idolatry today, if we will come to the well that is Yahweh and drink in his grace and forgiveness and mercy. So what is God like? That's his description of himself. Okay, last question before we take communion and go home to watch the Super Bowl. (laughs) How can we experience that God? If that's what angers God, if, if that's who God truly is, how, how can we experience that God? Throughout the whole passage, portions we read and portions we didn't read, it's clear that Moses stood between God and the people, or at least that's what it looks like. And it appears that God was moved by Moses. And the things that Moses reminded him of and said to him, the promises that he brought out, God, your reputation, your character, he's he's reminding God, he's appealing to God's nature and character and promises. Now, I believe that Moses was merely drawing out God's truest nature with his prayers. 
speaking and interceding in a way that provided God an avenue to beautifully declare his wonderful character over these golden calf worshipers and for Israel to experience that character. But, but how did Moses do this? What did Moses do? What did Moses say? What attributes did he have that moved God? Why did God hear his voice? Well, there's a lot of things that Moses said and a lot of back and forth that if we had a longer service, we'd have time for. But the three main things that Moses did is first he mediated uh, with God. He spoke to God. He interceded for Israel in his prayers. He reminded God of his promises. He met with God then every day in a temporary tent of meeting to fellowship with the Lord. So he spoke with God. Second, Moses was a mediator who spoke to the people. He represented God to the people. He came down the mountain. He threw the tablets to the ground. It was like a visual representation. You broke all these laws. God has seen what you have done. He reminded them of God. He, he ground the golden calf into powder, it says in the text. Put it on water, sprinkled it on water, and made the people drink it. It was like his way of saying, you're going to have to deal with some consequences to your actions. God will forgive you. God will give you grace. God will extend you incredible mercy. He'll bring you right back into this covenant, but there is a price to pay for this rebellion. He then confronted Aaron. Aaron had all these lame excuses. He's just like Adam in the Garden of Eden. You know, he's just got, he's like, I don't know. They brought me this gold. I threw it in the fire and this calf came out. That's what he said. Like, he's just nuts. Like, Moses is going to believe that. <laughs> and then Moses had a hand in disciplining the people severely. So, so he speaks to the people. But the third thing Moses did is at the center of this whole episode it's shocking. In his prayer with God, he offered himself instead of the people. After rebuking everyone, the next day, Moses goes back to God in prayer and he offers to die in their place if that's what it took for them to be forgiven. It's wild because the day before, God said, let my wrath burn hot against them, and I'll make a new nation. I'll fulfill all my Abrahamic promises through you, Moses. And Moses goes back up the next day. He's like, I don't want that offer. The offer I want is if, if I could somehow die so that they could go in, I want to die. And God rejects that offer. He says to Moses, whoever has sinned against me, that's the one that I will blot out of my book. In other words, Moses, you haven't sinned. The people have. Then he told Moses to go lead the people into the promised land and that he would go with them by his angel's presence, which led Moses to pray, God, please be the one to go with us directly. Okay, this last little thing I want to point out to you. How can we experience this God? Okay, my, the lesson I'm trying to draw out here in this final point isn't that we should be like Moses. That, that could be like a decent lesson, you know. Moses prayed, he spent time with the Lord. That's great, but that's not the point I'm trying to make here. The true lesson that I want to hold out is if you want to experience this God, you need to find a mediator like Moses. You need to find the one who is so close with the Father that his voice is always heard by the Father. You need to find the one who knows the Father so well that he represents the Father with perfection. You need to find the one who fully and totally deals with sin. You need to find the one who invites you into the renewal of repentance. You need to find the one who has familial closeness with God. And you need to find the one whose offer to die in our place was accepted by the Father. What am I saying here? You need to find Jesus. He's the one who builds the bridge from the Father to us. He translates God the Father's care and concern to us. He takes us to the glory of God's goodness. He unleashes the goodness of God upon his people. Paul said it this way in 1 Timothy 2.5. He said, for there is one God and there is one mediator between God and men, the man, Christ Jesus. Even Moses, later in his life, said that we should look for Jesus. 
40 years later, on the cusp of entering into the promised land, Moses told Israel, the Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me from among you, from your brothers. It is to him you shall listen. And when Jesus came around, John seems to have alluded to that when he said in John 1, 16, from his fullness, we have all received grace upon grace, for the law was given through Moses. Grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. Whose grace and whose truth came through Jesus Christ? Yahweh's grace, God's grace, his truth. Who he declared himself to be in Exodus 34, 6 and 7, that comes to us through Jesus Christ. Through the son's work on the cross, the father's love found no barrier. The veil in the temple was torn from top to bottom because Jesus' death unleashed the father's love and now we can fully know the Lord. The Lord, the Lord, a God merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness, keeping steadfast love for thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin, but who will by no means clear the guilty, visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children and the children's children to the third and fourth generation. How do we know that we have access and can experience this God? because of what Jesus did on the cross. And now we get to conclude our service by partaking of the Lord's table, communion, which reminds us of this incredible access that has been given to us by Jesus. Let's pray this morning. Lord, we thank you for your great goodness and grace. We thank you, Lord, for who you are. We, when we read Exodus 32 and see these people behaving as they did in the valley, if we're honest, Lord, if we see the truth, we relate to that. Here you are, Lord, you've worked so hard to produce the means of salvation. And so often we get distracted. We enter into things that are destructive for us, that pull us away from you. But then God, to see that there you are, you want us to get right back into the purpose and plans and desires that you have for us and that you have made a way for mercy and grace and love and forgiveness to flow from your throne to us. So often a rebellious people. Lord, thank you. We thank you. Before we eat of the bread and cup, I want to ask if there's anyone today for the first time you need to receive Jesus into your life. That forgiveness and grace that he wants to give, it must be received. You must believe that Jesus died in your place and rose from the grave. And if that describes you today, there will come a moment for you to proclaim to the whole world and church that you are his at your water baptism. But today, before a holy and righteous God, you need to surrender yourself to him. Say, Father, have mercy upon me, a sinner. Come into my life and make me new. Say to him, thank you for sending Jesus to live the perfect life for me and to die on my behalf on that cross and to rise from the grave on the third day.
help me now, Lord, by your power to live my life for you. Thank you, Lord. And Lord, now we, with this bread and cup in our hands, we rejoice at what you have done. Thank you, Lord. Thank you. Let's partake together. stand and sing to him. <clears throat> what can wash away my sins? Nothing but the blood, nothing but the blood. What can make me whole again? Nothing but the blood, nothing but the blood. Nothing can for sin atone, nothing but the blood, nothing but the blood, nothing good that I have done, nothing but the blood, nothing but the blood, this is all my hope and peace, nothing but the blood. Nothing but the blood for my future. This I plead. Nothing but the blood. I plead the blood. I plead the blood of Jesus. It's more than enough. I plead the blood. Jesus, I plead the blood, I plead the blood of Jesus, it's more than enough, so much more, I plead the blood of Jesus, oh, yes I plead the blood, no more shame, and no more guilt, only life, and only Amen. Jesus, we do plead that blood today, and we're thankful that you have forgiven us. We rejoice in salvation today and in your resurrection, and pray, God, this week that you would give us the strength to receive your love and to extend your love to the people around us. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen. Well, God bless you, church. Have a great afternoon. If you want to respond to the message that Nate just gave, please visit the Welcome Center. We'd love to talk to you about faith and baptism. Go Niners. Have a great day. God bless you.